So, we have a little bit more room in the front if people want to crowd around. We can get comfortable. You want to hand the front? Y'all can get comfortable in the front if you all like to, yeah? If no one can see in the back. <laughs> all right, everyone. So thank you all so, 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 so much for coming today. We're really excited. Um, it's a really crowded room, but this will be nice. It, it feels intimate that we're close as well. Yeah? So I want to start off by saying good afternoon um, and that we have a really exciting, I think exciting panel prepared for you all today. All right? So I want to start off by making a couple of acknowledgments. And so I'm reading off of my notes. I've been running around all day. I'm not reading off of notes because I don't love you and I didn't prepare, but it's because I want to make sure I get everything in. All right? So I want to start off by making just a couple of acknowledgments. One, um, we, Alok and I conceptualized the panel one day having a sleepover, yeah? And so we picked up the phone, we called Cece and said, hey, you're going to be at Creating Change, we want to do a panel together. And so the, the idea here is that we wanted to do a panel that would challenge transliberalism, right? And so what we see at Creating Change, some of us more than others, <laughs> is that Creating Change espouses a policy that doesn't necessarily hold all of our bodies and all of our lives, right? And so what we wanted to do in this space was to create an opportunity for trans people, more specifically people of color, to have space to have a radical politic as opposed to a liberal one, all right? So that's really the theme of what we're doing today. And so, um, we, so and, and under that guise of like creating change and, and, and um, trans liberal politics, I want to also acknowledge where we are today. We're here in Chicago. So who here is from Chicago? Y'all from Chicago for when y'all raise your hands? Well, I want to hear y'all. Who's from Chicago? <laughs> so Chicago um, is a place that originally belonged to native and indigenous people, right? Um, in Chicago, the modern city was erected by black labor that was stolen and forced here in the U.S., right? And so I want to make that acknowledgement and say that creating change is not removed from that legacy, yeah? Creating change is a part of that legacy. So it'd be remiss of us to have this panel and to sit here and to talk and to pretend that these things didn't happen, right? And also that these things aren't still happening today. So creating change is no stranger to stolen land, right? Um, we all know, and if you're not aware at this point, creating change has invited, disinvited, and then re-invited Zionists who yeah. fund and support the occupation of Palestine. Yeah. Right? Um, uh, creating change is a, a, is a part of exploiting that labor, right? There are many people who, here who are unpaid. There are many people here who are not mm -hmm. adequately supported, and creating change is not removed or absolved from that problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're here to all confront that, yeah? And so our bodies and our resistance and the work that we're going to do today hopefully will confront that. So I wanted to make those acknowledgments and to say that, um, that the work we're doing here hopefully will challenge those things that are happening and create a new politic, right? Yes. All right. So um, without further, so the, the way that it's going to work today is the three of us will go for maybe eight to ten minutes. We'll offer our initial remarks. Hi, Lathaya. We'll offer our initial remarks. And then we want to have a greater conversation, right? This is not just about us being experts. It's about hearing what everyone has to say, all right? So we're each going to go, and then we want to have a chance to engage. So first up is going to be my best friend, Hello, Feminine. <laughs> thanks, Josh. Um, thanks so much for coming, everyone. I just was feeling awkward, so I'd like to do a poem first, and then I'll talk, because <laughs> I think I know how to do that better. Yeah. Um, do it. Yeah. When I'm 11 years old, my father tells me that the parking lot smells a lot like marijuana. To say that I am scandalized would be an understatement. You see, I was the prude love child of my middle school's D.A.R.E. program, which means that I was taught that the minute you consume drugs, you become a very, very bad man. So when my father insinuates that he knows the smell, I judge him to be an evil person and tell him to confess immediately or I am running away from home. He laughs and says, the things you will never know about my past. I've never asked my father who he dated before my mother. I've never asked him about his first kiss. I do not know what he hoped his life would look like or whether or not that came true. You see, there's this thing that happens when you call someone a father. He ceases to become a person and instead becomes a punchline for everything that you hate about yourself. He becomes a parable, a story that begins with your birth as if on that day two new <coughs> people are born. Everything he is before this moment is now history, his story. There's this thing that happens when you are trans, when you know you are not a man because you know you are not your father's son. And the moment you tell him this, he becomes everything you are running away from. So in this way, being trans is another way of announcing, I'm running away from home. Mm -hmm. I've never asked my father what it felt like to become history, to watch 30 years of memory coil inside of his gut, so that every time he laughed, he could remember what it felt like to be young again. There's a VCR tape in the living room drawer. Fast forward to the scene where a man would look like me if I hadn't have run away from my father. Walks out next to a woman radiant enough to be the sunshine when I first opened my eyes. This is my parents' wedding video. In this shot, my father's best friend tells him that he can no longer be a rebel now that he's a married man. 
this is how I discover that my father used to be a rebel. When I meet his friends from college, they tell me that he spent most of his time hanging out with a man named Karl Marx and a dream of a decolonized India. They tell me I look just like him. And I want to say, no, I'm not a man. I mean, I'm not that man. My father laughs at me in this video. The same way he will laugh 15 years later in a parking lot. The same way he laughs when I'm back home and use words like revolution and now. And, I tell, and he tells me that he believes in incremental change. So, of course, I accuse him of being a middle-class liberal who's come to care more about his private property than he has his people. And he tells me that there's this thing that happens when you grow older. When you begin to recognize that you are no longer invincible. Which is, I think, my father's way of finally admitting that he was never invincible, that his hands were so sweaty from being afraid of all of the ways I began to look just like him that he could never quite hold on to me, which is, I think, with my father's way of finally admitting there are things I had to give up in order to have you. I gained the confidence to yell on the streets because I learned early on how to fight my father. I have been shouting at him for the past six years and calling it a relationship instead of a riot. Because maybe that's my way of admitting that I see myself in the flames. And maybe that makes all the difference. So when I was thinking about like what I wanted to say and stuff, I, I guess I just like talk about the things that are I'm going through or that are on my mind. And I just went through this really intense experience of going to my dad's like homeland in Kerala in India for like a really huge family reunion. And it was like actually the most intense experience of gender I've had in a very long time. And it allowed me to theorize gender in really new ways because there were so many moments where, you know, this was the first time I was going home where the thing about, like, the internet is it's made, like, coming out or whatever that means really hard because now there are weird videos and photos of me that my aunts and uncles are seeing, and they're like, what is your child doing? <laughs> Literally, I had an aunt come up to me once and be like, you're so convincing in your monologues. It's like it's your own life. And she, <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't understand that I was talking about my own life because, and then when I started to think about it, it was that the only way that my family understood my femininity was as a performance, uh, and that I was a drag queen, right? Or that I was trying to mimic or become something that I'm not, and because I'm a performer, it's okay that I'm trans because I'm on a stage. And it made me start to think about how every day when trans feminine people walk around, it's like we're on a stage. <laughs> that the yes. best performers I've ever met in my life are trans, because we've had to learn how to be both men, not men, women, not women, neither. <laughs> and we've learned every single script that there was, and we pick up on those cues, not because of some formal performance training or writing education, but because what we're actually trying to be doing is living and surviving, and yet we're evaluated every day for how good of a performance our artist we are, right? And how we don't talk about the artistry of being trans. I think that there's a, pre a precise sense of power and sophistication and so many of the powerful trans people I've met in my life and being able to think through what it's like to have to have your body as your first protest site <laughs> and have to literally from that point argue and argue and act and push for the legitimacy of your breathing and that seems to be a really profound thing for me. So. I was talking to my grandmother about being a performance artist and like performance and and then she was like, oh, I see that you're wearing saris now. And I was like, yeah. And I was so freaked out because she kept on threatening to come to my shows. And I have this like nightmare of her getting a heart attack and like seeing me in a sari and like whatever. Um, and then I was like, no, don't invite her, don't invite her. And then so for the rest of the trip, she kept on being like, why didn't you invite me? And I eventually had a conversation with her where I said, well, I was nervous because you've never seen me dress this way. Um, and then she said, I don't care what you look like, I care that you're an artist. And I started to unpack that with her. And she was like, you know, she didn't really have a lot of the words to say, but I think so many women in my family become children when their husbands die. <laughs> because it's the first time in their lives where they can actually do whatever the fuck they want. <laughs> and I think that there's a sense of liberation and an escape from patriarchy actually when your husband's dead. And I think my grandmother was actually saying, I'm an artist too, you know, we had this moment where she, and then I, I started to put on these clothes or whatever, and she was just giggling, and I was giggling, because I think gender's funny too, and, <laughs> and we were just 
was sitting there giggling and like so many systems and moments and ruptures just fell apart and I started to think, what, what is a trans politic if it's just about trans people? I'm not interested in it because my grandmother never consented to being a woman. She never did, because my father, when I wrote that poem about, when I saw him cry for the first time in India, um, it really made me think about the ways in which male socialization is one of the most violent things I've ever seen in my entire life. That my father was never told, cry. My father was never told, grieve. My father was never told, you're experiencing this thing and you can talk about it in public. And so instead, he internalized all of that and the product of it was man, but it feels very difficult to think that my father consented to being a man. I think he was made into a man. And, and I think that in a lot of ways, when I talk about gender with my family, it's so easy for me to be like, you guys are cis and I'm gender non-conforming. And, and I just turn back and I'm like, whoa, I remember my, my achima, which is how I say grandmother in Malayalam, giggling. And I think of that as its own type of politic, actually, that she actually is finding ways to recognize, to feel, to vibe that are outside of identity. Uh, and that are more about things like passion and meaning. Uh, and, and I think, what are we trying to do as a trans movement? Are we trying to make everyone understand us as if we are able to be contained by a word? <laughs> Is it so that if I get people to use they for me, they somehow get me? Is it that if they understand what gender non-conforming is, they understand the complexity? And I don't know if that's what we're actually fighting for, at least that's what I'm not, right? And, and I hope that as trans people, we can afford the types of complexities we have introspected in our own genders to everyone because I've never met a man or a woman in my life. <laughs> I've met people trying very hard and desperately to fit into a framework that was imposed on us. And I, and I think that for me, I've started to realize that a lot of the discrimination and persecution that I experience is from very sad people, not powerful people, not angry or prejudiced people, but people who were never allowed to be feminine growing up. And so when I hear about violence, I grieve two victims. I grieve both the person who has died, but I grieve also the soul that has died. I grieve because I think so much of transphobic violence in particular and transmisogynist violence comes from a culture of misogyny and transmisogyny where we teach these, quote, young boys, quote, that they cannot and will never be feminine, that they cannot and will never be soft. And so when I think about trans politics, actually, I think about my dad a lot. And, and my dad doesn't have to be trans for me to understand that my dad experienced transmisogyny, that my dad was always told, you look this way because you have these genitalia and these are the scripts I'm going to put you in, right? So I guess when I think about where we are as a trans movement or whatever, I'm really worried because it feels like we keep on regurgitating these dichotomies of us, them, when it comes to cis people, trans people, gender non people, whatever. And I think that these things are helpful and that they allow us to talk about different types of power, but I wonder what's being lost and how can we actually imagine a way of talking about gender that's actually about everyone and that actually recognizes that we all have a stake in eradicating, obliterating, ending, demolishing, destroying the gender binary. And that actually this thing called misogyny is a structure and that everyone is negatively impacted by misogyny. I, I, I just like feel like it's such a terrible structure. And it feels like so many times the ways that we talk about gender are just always interpersonal. Like, oh, they don't understand my pronouns, or they misgendered me, or they were yelling at things to me. But I want to like rewind and think, what is actually animating those people to act in these ways? Because sometimes when people scream things at me, I can't tell if they want to fuck me, they want to punch me, or they want to be me. <laughs> and I can hold all of those. And I, I feel like what's really the weird contradiction of living as a gender non-conforming person in this particular settler colony is that it, it tells us that everyone should be unique and find your truth. And then when we do, they punish us for it. And I think the desire to punish people who are creating new templates and new worlds with our bodies doesn't come from prejudice. I don't think, I don't think that that's what's happening. I think it comes from a recognition of oneself and someone else. I think it comes from all the ways in which we've internalized our own repressions, our own sacrifices, our own gendering processes. And I think trans people are often scapegoated, especially gender non-conforming folks who are visibly living at the intersections of all of these genders and traumas. So 
Relating that to the politics of the panel, um, I worry that what we're doing actually is not actually ending trans misogyny or creating movements to end misogyny, but rather creating movements to just do everything that was being done by cis people, now by trans people, and actually just not actually challenging the structure and recognizing that, of course, we're theorizing and politicking and living and dreaming an incredible scarcity, an incredible violence and fear and persecution, and that's influencing us. But I, I just wonder all the time if there's a way to talk about gender in more complicated ways that doesn't isolate people. And I struggle because I feel like so many times people in the world say that non-binary people are too academic. <laughs> that like this idea that you cannot be a man or a woman is just like an academic thing that you picked up in school. Yeah. And I'm just sort of like, what the fuck? <laughs> There's a long, long, long complicated history of gender that will never be captured by this thing called trans, ever. And that I would like to think that we could imagine that every single person in the world is capable of producing a different gender that's not fixed that could transform, that's relational. I always say, winter is so transmisogynous. Like, how are you supposed to look good and fat in the winter? I really can't let it, let it, let it be well done that a lot of us are doing it anyway. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. But, you know, gender as being, and, and I, then when I start thinking about the ways that we've become successful as a trans movement, uh, whatever success means when there's still so much incredible violence against black trans people, native trans people, other trans folks of color, is that we've solidified this idea of a gender identity, right? And you hear that in Vogue everywhere we go. People ask, what is your gender? And I'm just sort of like, I really fucking don't know. <laughs> IDK, I'm, I'm, maybe one day I'm this, maybe one day I'm that. And I feel like what's happening now is we take gender nonconformity and we assign it to gender nonconforming people. <laughs> and we assign it to non-binary people as if everyone else is gender conforming. Oh, and I feel uh, like what the history of queer movements in this country has been was that the feminist movement said, okay, we're not gender nonconforming. The gay movement said, okay, we're not gender non-conforming. And now we have a binary trans movement that's saying, okay, we're not gender non-conforming. And then now we have a white non-binary movement that's saying, okay, we're not like them. And so then I think that like we're left at the end just sort of being like, but you're all of us. And the reason that we do this work is not because of our own identities, but because we recognize that you are so fucking complicated. And that you're beautiful because you're complicated. And that you're going to use words like man, and I'm going to use words like he for you, but I want to see you. <laughs> And that's what we're fighting for. So when I think about what that's going to look like when we're talking about our movement cultures, I think it's really about moving away from this idea that there's such a thing as a trans community, um, that there's a, a discrete group of community of people who have this shared universal experience. Because actually, I think that we all um, are living and vibing in different bodies and different sensibilities and different aesthetics, and that's our power <coughs> and our strength. But I worry that what we're making is the same mistakes as every other movement where we recognize that if only we put out the thin folks, the people who are hairless, the people who have gone through what society regards as transition, the people who are state recognized, the people who have a narrative that they were always this way, born this way, that this is their fixed identity, that they are not that sexual, that they're heterosexual, that they're monogamous, that they're respectable. And that's what we're doing. And that doesn't seem like a movement for me. That seems like just like the same old bullshit. <laughs> like, I don't know. I just, I just wish that we could respect <coughs> that no one should have to ever censor themselves in order to be seen as a legitimate person, that no one should ever have to and undergo surgery or take hormones or dress this way or look this way in order to speak about their experiences. And I think that the dynamic of violence we never talk about in trans community is intra-community violence. That actually for me and for a lot of folks in my life who are gender non-conforming or non-binary, a lot of the violence we experience is from binary trans people who call us <laughs> dirty drag queens, who tell us that we need to shave, otherwise we look like pieces of shit, who tell us that maybe if we took hormones we would stop looking so fucking stone and butch and nasty. And that hurts so much because what I just want to say over and over and over again is they did the same thing to you. Oh, and and then when I think about where that comes from, it's very difficult because I don't want to say it's your fault. I want to say it's part of a system that requires us to participate and white and cis and ableist and thin and class ideas thin, of femininity yes, and masculinity. Yes. And if we don't, we take it out on everyone else. And I think that what actually I would like to see is <coughs> actually commit to a form of friendship 
I don't know if solidarity is useful or helpful, but a form of friendship where we can commit each other to one another's transcendence, right? Not necessarily transitions, because maybe not everyone's transitioning, but one another's transcendence, where I can just see you, and I can see your difference, and be like, you go, yeah! <laughs> or you can be like, I want to take horse, I'm like, awesome, let's make that happen. You don't want to take horse, cool, great. But we're just so not there. <laughs> and I find over and over again, every single time I try to work professionally as a non-binary person, I'm misgendered when I spend five hours talking about being trans. I'll, yes! go, up, I'll go up in front of a stage and I'm like, I've never been a boy. I hate being a boy. This is who I am. Blah, blah. And they're like, you just gave an amazing speech. He's so wonderful. And I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, what are we doing? And, and I think what we're doing is we're actually, when we talk about trans visibility, we shouldn't be talking about trans visibility because trans is not what we look like. It's who we fucking are. And that when we talk about trans visibility, that's one of the most oxymoronic things I've ever seen in my life because one, visibility is not saving us. In fact, visibility is allowing the state to tokenize us as it continues mass erasure and violence and theft and genocide against the most most vulnerable in our communities too, who gets to become visible are the people who the state already sees, the people who appeal to the types of images and ideas and aesthetics and narratives that the state wants to see and the rest of us are just seen as tranny faggots or as disposable or as ugly. And then also, why are we so obsessed with the fetish of visibility? Are there not ways of being in our genders, of relating to our families and our communities, of getting dressed that are not actually about the visible? Because often I feel like I'm never understood as a trans person, and especially as a woman or as a femme person, unless every single day I shave, unless every single day I put on makeup, unless every single day I wear white women's clothing, <laughs> unless white every single day <laughs> I say, oh, I want to change my name. And I should not have to go through those barriers, right? What I'm fighting for and what I hope we could fight for is something so fucking simple. And that's actually that we allow people to be. We don't make people do, or feel, or say, or dress, or look. We're just kind of like, be. And that actually, we're trying to create a world where everyone can just be, and the onus is on us to help them be. Yes. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. But yet, people make it so impossible to live in this world as a gender unconforming person. Choose one, choose one, choose one, choose one. There's only two, there's only two. Did you read that in queer theory? What the fuck? <laughs> like, how? How are we still at a place where the idea of existing outside of man or woman is still seen as just a theory or a fiction? Uh, and then I guess I would just like to close, but not close, because I'm so excited to hear from my friends here who are way smarter and more amazing and wonderful than me, um, is... I love you, Alok. Thank you. Um, oh, about the body, right? So I think also what's really frustrating is that when we talk about trans visibility, we're always still talking about the body, where it's like the only way we understand people's transness is if they wear a dress or if they get hormones and they change their bodies. And it just makes me really sad because I just, I really feel like what it is is because through various processes of colonization and racial and state violence, we've been separated from other ways of understanding gender that are completely outside of our bodies, right? So when I'm, I'm talking about the move away from like our gender identities I, and towards a relational gender, I'm talking about, oh, wow, I'm making a full circle, my conversation with my grandmother. <laughs> because what I felt in that moment was a way of negotiating our gender collectively, where she was just kind of like, I've made these compromises, you've made these compromises, you were that, it's kind of funny, cool. <laughs> and it was that weird informal way of acknowledging each other's mutual complicatedness, each, one another's mutual secrets, one another's mutual repression, and actually negotiating it on a relational basis so that the gender I give to my grandmother is gender is different than the gender I give to someone I'm fucking is different to the gender I give to myself you know and that I can hold all of those things because my gender doesn't belong to me right and that my gender actually is part of something bigger <coughs> and so I just would hope that we could move beyond the body because what that is doing is once again regurgitating this really gross biological determinism that we are only what a white doctor and a white coat told us that we were and that that doctor learned that from a curriculum that came from long histories of eugenics and racial violence that actually some state some doctor could ever tell me who I was if I say I was a woman I was born a woman and every single part of my body was already always a woman if I say I was neither a man or a woman I do not have a penis I do not have male organs I have my fucking self but yet every single institution in this world is set up to usurp our own autonomy and our own self-narration of our bodies and that's awful so I guess I would just close to say I really wish and hope 
that we can build movements for gender self-determination that are communal. <laughs> so it's a kind of a paradox where I want everyone to be able to find themselves but be able to talk to one another about it. So we can just be different Wikipedias for people, being like, hey, I'm kind of exploring this. And someone could be like, yeah, cool, here's some lipstick. Oh, cool, <laughs> great. And then we're always helping people be. And that could be really neat and wonderful. <laughs> so, Yay. yeah, that's it. Now I wasn't gonna open with life and fancy people. No. I, was, I, was, um, yeah, I love you, CJ. Yeah. I love you, Kasha. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I am really high right now. I smoked a lot of weed. <laughs> know me, a lot of people know where I stand um, with my, you know, I'm very unfiltered. I say what I mean, I mean what I say. I'm a zero tolerance for fuck boys or bullshit type of girl. Um, and I just, um, I bring, uh, you know, hashtag ratchet intellectualism to uh, <laughs> uh, trying to get where I come from. So I use lingo, I say things, I come from my perspective. So if I offend you in any way, fuck you. Um, I, I love the people that I'm on this panel with. Um, they know me very well. And um, I think for a lot of people who don't know me, they see me as this image yeah, as the poster child for um, uh, anti-neo-Nazism and things like that. Um, and a lot of people know my story, a lot of people don't, whatever the case may be. Um, and my thing is, uh, and what I've been noticing a lot lately, and speaking on to um, just something in particular that has been happening here in Creating Change, is the shadiness. I just feel like especially for all the people of color in this room, especially black women, black trans women, black cis women, like our unity um, in these spaces is is giving uh, kind of this uh, love and hip hop uh, TV show reality to the white folk. And they're sopping it up like great for this um, I just feel like we are, we are giving ourselves uh, this imagery that kind of perpetuates this idea that most people have about us. And I'm not talking about uh, the angry black woman, but I'm talking about the angry black woman. And we're angry at all the wrong things. We're angry at each other. Well, we're not angry at each other, but we're angry at what's happening to us and we're taking it out on each other. And I feel like that, that shadiness, that type of... Um, dynamic has kind of dwindled our forefront, you know, thinking about the things that we have fought for. And I'm, and I'm not talking about any type of regular shade. I mean, of course, we could be shady like, oh, this bitch got the same lip color as me. Okay, I see she's trying to come. No, I'm talking about having this idea that we can allow... Uh, each other to attack each other, whether it be verbally or physically, that is intolerable for what our trans ancestors have fought for. I'm talking about women that have stood together, um, both brown and black, and can and stand and stood with each other and said that we are here for this movement, which a lot of us are now privileging from because uh, you know a lot of you cis folks decided to take over that and was like, oh, I'm gonna have ownership of that. We which is like, um, in a way, cultural colonialism. Like you took you you took the shine from something that has been there, and now you're like, oh look at me, I can have this, I own this. Um, which you don't. That's something that trans people have fought long and hard for, and for so many cis gay folk that's here at Creating Change, I feel like. Um, 
things things have not been looking cute. Like, why aren't people being paid? Why aren't rooms being given to people for free? Why why aren't meals given for free? We're paying. I heard that there was a, a a low income rate. What the fuck is that? Like, how do you tell me as a person who's making eight dollars an hour or living off of food stamps that I have to pay one hundred and sixty eight dollars to come for nothing? What am I? What am I gaining from this? And how can I leave this place knowing that I am empowered, that I'm encouraged, that I um, that I know that we are creating change? And I and quite frankly, um, I really wasn't gonna come. If, if they literally convinced me I was not gonna come. I was like, I could be at work. I, I would rather be at work making my coin and living my life. Um, and they they literally, um, you know, kind of set. Said, like this would be a good panel like you know we really want you to be here and like try and like there were a lot of shit that was like stopping me from getting here right like I'm like oh my gosh I, this, they're not gonna let me on this plane this is a sign I'm gonna, I'm gonna something's gonna happen you know what I'm saying I'm like I just I, I think I shouldn't go and like it, it happened. I made it here. And <laughs> the first thing I hear when I get here is like, oh my gosh, the drama, the drama, the drama. And it's like, see, I could have stayed my black ass at home <laughs> work, and I had to deal with this. But I feel like how we in a how we at a conference about creating change and everybody is still throwing shade. Everybody is saying this about that person, that about this person. Nobody is really actively sitting down with their brothers and sisters and their in betweeners, whoever for my gender non conforming people, you know, because you know, you're not my brother or my sister or both or neither. And so I feel like how can we come into these spaces and not even be able to sit down with each other and ask each other about each other's issues? How, how am I advocating for you, my sister, or my brother, or my person, or my loved one? How am I, what do you need from me? Everybody is for themselves, and I feel like um, so many people who walk around here and with their nose is stuck up and acting like, oh my gosh, I'm at creating change. You know, I, I have buku cash, and look at me, and like, <laughs> looking at, right, and it's like, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> like having this idea that we can um, commune with each other and the lack of community and the lack of advocating for each other on a level that's more than just I feel like we talk about the things that we're against you know like as a trans woman I don't want to be tolerated but I feel like a lot of people are tolerating each other like in these spaces like we're not even taking time to actually understand what's actually wrong with this person why are they feeling this way why are, why are we protesting why are we going against these people why am I standing on this panel or that panel or why you know what I'm saying? There are so many things that are happening right now that we're not taking time for each other to understand each other, to love each other. That's that's what ch that's where change is coming from. That's where change comes from. You cannot create change if there is no love, if there is no understanding. I don't want to be just tolerated. I want you to understand me, understand what I'm really going through. Not that I'm just sitting up here and that I have this image and that everybody knows me, but actually know that I'm still living off of food stamps, that I do have an $8 hour job, that I live with a roommate who has uh, um, scoliosis and just found out that was diabetic and what I might be going through. But people see me as an image and they don't understand. And that's what we do to each other. We see each other as an image. Like, oh, I see that bitch on Facebook all the time. Yeah. She thinks she cute. You know what I'm saying? We never actually think about what that person is going through or or what what might be ailing them or how we can be a person that can uplift them or make them a better person because we're too focused on how much I can show off or nobody's caring about me enough, but we never sit down with each other to even get to that point. Mm. So... I feel like sitting in these spaces and, and being the radical that I am, a lot of people know that I do, I love everybody. I love everybody, race, gender, whatever. I won't say class and some of the other things because I feel like <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't, I just can't. Um, because I just, feel some, I, I, I just feel some type of way, especially for a lot of people in here, probably in this room right now, that has like buku cash but only giving five dollars to the girls. They be like, I'm gonna make a donation, she five dollars. But, <laughs> but you make 250k a year, right? So I'm just gonna, you know, throw that out there. But, um, <laughs> just to think how we live in this world where um, we are constantly being uh, 
group that we're constantly being marginalized and we're fighting against that, but we marginal marginalize ourselves. And we can't think outside those boxes because we are thinking about how much more. Like, even when we're not thinking about it, subconsciously, we're like, how, how can I conform? How can I be accepted? Who can love me? Who can take me? And it's like, we're not really trying to go against those systems or challenge those systems to say, oh, I don't need this shit to, to make me feel validated. I am here. My existence is real because I can feel myself. I am interacting. I am loving. I am caring. I am kissing. I am fucking. Whatever the case may be. But I'm in this space and I feel like a lot of times people let go of that and people just see us for the props that we have already been created as. I don't want you to see me as a prop. I don't want you to see me as a character in your play. Our lives are, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the saying? Your life is a play with no, no, no. All the world's a stage with, and we're all just players in it, that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but basically, no, that was the one. That was the one. But, I just feel like, you know, we take our lives for granted. And I feel like a lot of the pettiness um, that's happening is because we are we are so lost in ourselves. We don't know who we are. We haven't even actually found the time or the space to love ourselves correctly so that we can give that love to other people. So the shadiness is going to come naturally, whether it's because you've been tired, you just did a 12-hour shift, or you just a shady bitch. You grew up a shady bitch. You just, that's a party. That's a part of your nature. You know what I'm saying? But I just feel like... Um, we aren't we're aren't we aren't taking the time to understand each other and figure out what the actual issues are. Um, and we're fighting against each other in a system that want us to fight against each other. Um, and I and I see that constantly. Um, I just feel like with the way that uh, with trans, like you were saying, I don't know what that means, but trans visibility um, is like this this. Um, this um, this competition for a top spot and like <laughs> for me like as a black trans woman look at other black trans women I feel like it's a long continuous show of America's next top trans woman it's like everybody is trying to win that win that trophy and it's like why are we going against each other for that when we could be uplifting and celebrating each other and we all could be top top trans women we don't have that there everybody want to have that leadership role or be number one and it's like you why do we feel like we have to continue continuously live in a patriarchal world where we have to say who is above who and who are my minions and who is my side hench or who is my henchman and you know what I'm saying like we need to just live in a world where we can all be equal to each other, understand each other, and not feel like we are challenging each other, but uplift each other and, and really think of a liberative, radical movement that is not just about, um, you know, who's going to be picking up the scraps or feeling like you have to pick up. It's not our fault that we... that none of us are getting paid or that we have to fight for these things because I feel like the people that we need to be mad are uh, mad at are looking at us and laughing in our faces and saying, hey, bitch, I'll give you $10 an hour, but your homegirl ain't getting a job too. And so now your homegirl mad at you and she's like, well, bitch, now I feel like you sold me out or you selling out. And that's not the case at all. But, we're, but we shouldn't be fighting each other about that those things. We need to be fighting these people about that. Why aren't you hiring more trans women? I don't want to feel like I'm a part of some type of affirmative action. Like, I need a job. I need to work. I need to supply for my family. I need to supply for myself. I need to live. And and we get mad at each other. We bicker and we fight. And guess what? CC not for the drama. My ass is going to be somewhere smoking blunts, uh, watching uh, Power Rangers or something. Yeah. I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time for the nonsense. I feel like, you know, I, I've come so far and even being here, being born and raised in Chicago and just walking up and down these streets and just having so many memories of when I was homeless and thinking about the things that I've done and having, and having my little my little clique and how we were so down for each other and the things that we did for each other and making sure that each other was okay. And I feel like... Um, 
this trans trans visibility thing kind of um, made trans women feel like that feel like we have to constantly go against each other and I in thinking back on the days when, you know, the first trans woman I met was here in Chicago and thinking about how she would sit and talk with me and tell me, uh, don't feel like you need to have surgeries to be a woman or this and that. And, you know, hearing somebody actually validate me as a woman without feeling like I needed to have, you know, bags or a snatch to feel good about myself. I, I just feel like that's that. That encouraged. That was like my first time of encouragement, especially after being homeless and running away from home and having somebody validate me in a way that says, like you were saying, like I don't have to shave to be a woman. I don't have to have long hair to be a woman. I don't have to wear these clothes to say that I'm a woman or that I should feel like I need these things to be a woman. And if I do do these things, that is on my own desire that I'm not doing this to make anybody else feel better about my existence because I'm going to be here regardless. I did not ask to be born. I did not ask to be here. You know what I'm saying? So to think that so many tr other trans people and gender nonconforming people felt like that, but couldn't live through that or or is mad because they can't identify in a way that they need to to be happy um, and, and take it out on each other is just complete nonsense. And I feel like what we need to do is have more time where we're actually sitting down with each other, even if it's a person that you've never met before. Just walk up to that person. I mean, how many people in this conference have already clicked off and, went and only associate with the people that they know or that they see? And everybody, of course, came up to me because they're like, oh, you're Cece. And it's like, oh, yeah, of course I'm Cece. But how many people are actually coming up to me and being like, hey, girl, what's your tea like? You okay? You going through something? Tree session. Yes, you know what I'm saying? Tree session always. I will never turn you down. Okay? You have a tree session, I'm there. Um, but, also, but also, how are you feeling, right? Also, right, exactly. Right. Not because I'm just Cece McDonald. But that I'm Cece, that I'm a human being, that I'm a person that's not just the image, that I'm a human being that has human feelings that go through human things. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of people don't know my story, but they only know it from Google or from whatever, or a friend or something, and I just feel like we are not taking the time to be um, personal with people. We're not taking the time to actually know what's going on with each other. We're not actually figuring out what we need from each other to even think about a liberative uh, movement. You know what I'm saying? Love is a radical act, right? Why do we think about radical action and we cannot even love each other? We cannot even... Some of us can't even tolerate being around each other for five minutes, but y'all want to expect to move forward. So I think that thinking about all the things, thinking about all all these movements and how it's important um, to think about how much you're loving yourself, how much you are trying to understand the people around you and what they're going through, um, to figure out what our movements are about, to understand the cultural difference and the intersectionalities within those, to think about how we're all connected in some way. It's important to think about those things if you want to think about a radical movement. You have to think about how you are giving to your community. Um, I know a lot of people know my stance on allyship. Um, if, you are, if you claim to be an ally, <laughs> that's good. Pat on your back. But I feel like um, thinking about it on a, on a level as to... Um, how much of a risk taker are you being? How much of yourself are you willing to give? A lot of people don't even want to acknowledge their fucking privileges, but you walk around and say, oh, I'm an ally. No, you're not an ally because you sat there with your white ass. You let all my black friends get arrested. And you said, oh, I'm going to walk away from this situation because I don't know how to handle it. That's not being an ally. That's just being a pretender. And for a lot of people who claim to be allies, I just feel like it's bogus. Cis women who claim to be allies towards trans women who allow trans women misogyny to exist in those spaces and say, oh, look, oh, I'm your I'm your girlfriend, but you just let this man call me a faggot, or you let him uh, misgender me, or whatever the case may be, and, and you walked on, and you went on about your day, and you said, oh, well, I didn't know how to handle that situation. Think about the people who don't have a choice about whether or not they want a, a confrontation. Think about how uh, people are constantly um, challenging the status quo or whatever the case may be by um, 
using their privileges to say, hey, I know that I have this platform or I have this privilege and I'm using this to speak out against these issues. And not so many people are doing that. And I just feel like it's just, um, it's disgusting, actually, to think that you can sit there and be like, oh, I'm your ally and and then be two-faced about it and then... And then still be like, oh, I'm an ally. Because if I see the show, I'm going to call you out. And for a lot of people, I know that I don't do it more oh so often because I'm like, I'm going to see how many times this bitch thinks she's going to get away with it. But <laughs> the next time, the next time, okay. But, you know, because I have, I try, I try to be CeCe McDonald and I try to keep it cute. But, like, I feel like... Mm, I'm tired of walking on eggshells. I'm tired of biting my tongue. I'm tired of feeling like I have to coax someone's ego to make them feel better about my movement. I, that's not my job. That's not my job. So okay. if you want somebody, if you want somebody to make you feel good, go to uh, Pornhub and figure it out for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here to make you feel better about yourself. I'm not here to make you feel like uh, that. What, what you're giving is um, tolerable or is, is accepted because I feel like we're living in an era where my sisters are still being murdered and people are still like, yeah, I can get married now. And it's like, fuck your marriage because I don't care about marriage. And, and, and okay, look, <laughs> I get so frustrated because I think about all the things that I see my sisters going through. And then, not only what they're going through, but how they take it out on each other. Yeah. I see how we as a community, as a whole, I'm talking about the whole LGBTQIA community, it's just so shady towards each other. It's like the cis people against the trans and gender non-conforming people. It's the, um, it's the blacks versus the whites, because I, I don't seem to understand why nobody still has acknowledged the racism in the uh, LGBTQIA community. Um, I mean, it's very, it's very much there. If you don't see it, it's there. It exists. And it's, these are problematic to any type of movement, and we cannot keep thinking that any of this shit is cool. I mean... What are you doing? What are you doing in yourself right now that you feel is contributing to the movement? How are you reaching out to people outside of the people that you know? How many people have um, hit up a random person? Well, that's probably weird to hit up a random person on social media. Um, but to reach out to somebody and be like, I love you. I understand you. I understand that you might be going through something. Or just just to interact with somebody. Like, we cannot have any type of movements without love. Think about that. We cannot have no movement without love and understanding and compassion and empathy. And to understand why is my fellow comrade feeling the way that they're feeling or going through what they're going through. And how can I be the person to assist them, to uplift them, to educate them, to love them, to support them, to make them the better person that they need to be? All right, how y'all? How's everyone feeling now? Good evening. Oh, yeah, good. Right, good evening, good evening. Black Lives Matter. <laughs> so, so, when thinking about how I would introduce myself, I'm like, I don't know how to start, right? So, Lok is an artist, CC is Google. And. <laughs> direct action organizer so I'm like well shit what can I do but as organizers do I figure it the fuck out so let's do a call and response thing all right if y'all are down for that so um, I'm gonna count to three and you're gonna say your name all right and then I'm gonna count to three a second time and you're gonna say the name of a loved one a comrade or someone who is either alive or not here with us in this room today um, excuse me, either not alive or not here with us in this room today, who you stand on the shoulders of or exist on the shoulders of, right? Because we're not all here, it's just ourselves. Um, we, we exist on a legacy of resistance, right? All right, so I'm going to count to three. The first time you're going to say your name, and I'm going to count to three again, and the second time you're going to say the other person's name. Y'all ready? All right. We'll give you a second to think about it. <laughs> 
Well, not for their names, right? <laughs> 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 All right, one, two, three. Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. Thank you all for that. So yeah, the reason that I that I wanted to open with that is because I think that so often we come into these spaces and we and, and we just think that we're ourselves, right? But when I was preparing my remarks for coming here today, I thought so much about how I wouldn't exist if my ancestors didn't resist, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I actually wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be having breath. And the breath that's in my lungs actually doesn't just belong to me. It belongs to the people that came before me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like it's kind of my duty to carry on that legacy of resistance. Um, so I want to, so hi, everyone. My name is Joshua Allen. I'm an organizer. I'm an abolitionist. And when I say abolitionist, a lot of people say, like, what the fuck does that mean? What do you mean by abolitionist? Slavery's over, right? Mm -hmm. So I say two things for that. Huh. One. Slavery isn't over, right? I promise you slavery is not over, and we have a lot of work to do to end it, yeah? And also that I think that abolition has this weird connotation of dismantling things, and, and other parts of it gets left out, right? So when I say I'm an abolitionist, what I'm saying is, is I'm someone who's organizing to end and dismantle oppressive systems, and also someone who's working to build a world without them, yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's who I am. I'm also the responsible one out of a low CC and myself. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep my remarks very brief tonight um, or, or this evening, so that way we can have this greater dialogue amongst each other. Because there's a lot of you all here, and in no way are the three of us experts. We're all just people who have lived in our own bodies and our own experiences for a certain amount of time, right? And what we want to do is hear from you all, so we can learn from each other. All right? So I just really wanted to point out a couple of things, and, and you both hit on things that I wanted to talk about. But there are certain things that I would feel ashamed of myself if I didn't leave. Here say, all right? So I want to hit on just a couple of them. Um, the, the first one is like anti-blackness and trans movement. Oh my right? yes. That's something that we have to talk about. So when we think of, let someone please be brave enough to say this. When we think of who's killing trans women and trans people, who, who comes to your mind? Who's in the media? Who, who's the ones who are doing it? All of them. Black men. Black men. Right. Six men, partners. Right. Partners. Right, partners too, yeah. But the first thing is, is mostly black men, right? Black cis men who come to people's minds, yeah? And so if we have a movement that's built on like criminalizing and or blaming and punishing black cis men, that's a problem, right? Yes. Also, we have to recognize that like in, in white people's eyes and cis people's eyes, a lot of our bodies and identities are not even legitimate, right? right. So as a trans person, I may be sitting here, but like when, when Tom comes out, when Tom comes into this room, right, and doesn't know anything about creating change or trans or anything, he looks at me and reads me as a black cis man. Man, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not doing this shit right. Like we're not actually building a movement that's gonna get us free if what we're doing is criminalizing people, right? Mm -hmm. Movements don't like movements for justice are not built on incarcerating and imprisoning people. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah? And so one thing that I wanted to make sure that I brought into the space today is that trans movements ain't shit if they're incarcerating people. Right? Mm -hmm. Trans movements ain't shit while putting the police are around, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, like yeah. none of our bodies, trans bodies especially, are never safe in prison, right? Mm -hmm. Are Not never sure. safe around police. And what I'm interested in is building a movement and where, where we have a world without prisons, without cages, without police, and we find ways that relate to each other and relate to our safeties without those institutions. <coughs> so that's one thing I wanted to bring up. Another thing that I wanted to bring up um, was th these efforts for, for inclusion in certain institutions, right? So, um, and this is something that's really popular at, um, at, at the task force, um, really popular at like the mainstream creating change workshops and events is that people are excited about um, uh, things like trans inclusion in the military, right? <laughs> about <laughs> right, right. About things like um, like what like they have that trans staffer at the White House now. Right? Um, things like um, also people are excited about like trans. Trans inclusion in corporate spaces, right? And police forces. And police forces, yeah. And that's something that we also really, really need to critically engage. So Alok spoke really beautifully about representation, but I, what I want to leave you all with is that we need to think about more about, uh, we need to think less about how we can be included in the white man's institutions and more about how we can build safety and survival for ourselves, right? That's what we need to do. So I, what, in, in, no way, in no way am I looking to critique people who are looking to survive, right? And what I do understand is that oftentimes when people say that I want to, like, I want trans people to be included in corporate spaces, or in whatever spaces, what they're actually saying is that I want trans people to have money. I want trans people to have jobs, right? But what I'm interested in doing is pushing the trans movement to become strong and robust enough to where all of us can live without without going to toxic institutions, right? So what I'm interested in, in, in doing is making sure trans people can have jobs that are not in the military, right? That are not like in the White House, right? Because we have to recognize that the military is the reason that so much transphobia in the U.S. exists today, yeah? And so it's especially insidious when our bodies are deployed to go kill other people in other parts of the world, right? And 
enact our own oppression on each other. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, yes. And that's not the movement that I'm interested in being a part of, right? That's not what my body exists to do. I'm and that's sure. something that I want this movement to, to grow into, right? And that I'm very much so looking to become a part of. Um, the last thing I'll say, and I have a, co- a couple more things, but the, la- the last thing I'll say here um, is it also feels like in the last couple of years there's been this really this big push for intersectionality, right? And so every movement, like the best movements are the ones that have everyone in it, yeah? And so we saw it's like climate change finally started having indigenous people like, you know, 700 years too late. <laughs> and, uh, who, who, else is, who else is doing stuff? Like, um... Like a lot of the racial justice movements finally started listening to young people, you know. Um, and anti-war, right? Anti, like anti-war like movement started bullshit. including people who were other than like old white people, Party. right? <coughs> and so movement started diversifying, right? And that made things a little bit cooler and a little bit more important, yeah. But that's actually all bullshit. That's all bullshit, right? Like the the we, I, I'm actually not interested in engaging in the politics of representation in any of these kind of things, right? Our bodies have always been present. Trans people have always been present and like in, 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 in struggles for justice around climate change, right? Mm-hmm. Our bodies have always been present around struggles for racial justice. Like, what is my black ass not doing not there, right? <laughs> like, we're, we've always been in these spaces. We've always been leading these movements. We've always been leading work, right? And so when you're in, when you're in either a nonprofit or a movement space where you're automatically being thrust forward because you're the trans one or you're the gay one or you're the queer one, something there ain't right, you know? Your voice should be valued, you know? Your intellect should be valued. What you offer in terms of organizing should be valued in the movement, not just what your identity is, yeah? Right. And so I'm interested in also dismantling trans tokenism, because that's some bullshit, yeah. Yeah. all right? So what I want to do also when speaking about tokenism and like the different ways that liberal movements position us against each other, as I don't know if y'all noticed or if any of y'all had this conflict today, but what happened, well, I personally had the conflict, the task force, which is so amazing, the task force does everything well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if, any, if any staff person in the task force is here, please relay this information to your boss. Do better. Do better. Please do better by all of us. All right? So what happened to me today was I was booked for a three-hour training and this panel at the same time, right? And so what happens is, like what always what CC was outlining earlier, is there's competition among black people, competition among trans people, right? So now my black body is supposed to be here and there. Yeah, that's one something I can't really do right now. Maybe I'll learn how to teleport next week, but for right now, I'm not doing that, right? And so, um, what, the, way, the way these institutions are set up is that we have to pick and choose, right? You have to pick and choose where you can show up and who you can be and who you cannot be. And I'm interested in dismantling that today, yeah? And so a lot of the people who were in the three hour, who, were, who was in the three hour training for the Black Panther Party earlier? People are in the room here, right? So thank you all for making it down here and transitioning to this part of the work as well. And so what I wanted, so what basically what happened is we had to leave that workshop earlier and like and close that part of it to come here so both of these things can happen and, um, at, at, at one time, right? And so what I wanted to do was echo that once again, this is not about me being expert. This is not about any of us being experts, right? But rather about how we can build a movement that's big enough to hold all of us. <coughs> and that's how we'll survive. That's how all of us will get out of the shit alive. And so what I want to do now is cut my remarks short and give time to my amazing, amazing co-facilitator from earlier, um, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant organizer, Malcolm Shanks, to come speak to us about the intersections of the racial justice movement, the black liberation movement, um, and what's going on in our trans movement now, okay? So please welcome Malcolm Shanks. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is my name is Malcolm Shanks. Um, my pronouns are they and he. Um, who? Uh, and I think um, that I have been in a job for the past few years that has been trying to make me into a sellout. <laughs> so um, I do. I want to talk. I want to talk about uh, the Black Liberation Movement, but I also want to talk about the conflict that, that that keeps my unqualified ass even on this panel, right? So like, so. The only reason, the only reason that I'm sitting here right now is because, like, the organization that I literally work for, so I'm about to do some truth telling, so <laughs> let's get ready, <laughs> um, is, is because they don't value black knowledge. They don't value trans knowledge. They don't value the knowledge of anybody who's marginalized at all. And so what happens is that every time any of us fight for any kind of voice or any kind of platform, we might get it that one specific time if we threaten to blow up somebody's fucking spot. And then the next time, we have to go back and do that fight all over again. And so what's happened is that our hearts are shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and getting more and more and more holes in them until all we do is just leak out onto the carpet with our emotions and our hurt and our 
trauma, yeah. right? That's what it sometimes means to work in nonprofit organizations as a person who, like, not even not even holds multiple marginalized identities, but literally just wants to show up for our people, right? Mm-hmm. Like, who wants to actually stop us from like murdering each other? Who wants to do harm reduction, like? Like, not even inside, but across these dumb-ass organizations that, pay, that sign our checks and expect us to identify with them just because they give us some money every two weeks. Yeah. 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 Okay. It ain't that much right? It ain't even that much. <laughs> it's clearly never enough. <laughs> You know, and so that's that's the conflict that that's the conflict that leads here, right? And so a lot of us are consistently put in the place of like in order to like in order to in order to like not apologize anymore for the places where we are, we simply have to quit and leave and just count our losses and say goodbye, right? Um, and so there are a lot of things that are just embarrassing <laughs> about the way that the task force has put on this event. Just frankly embarrassing and disgusting. Um, yeah. And they're not, and they're, and they, and they, and they make it difficult for 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 anyone to feel like we can be alive and do this work and be sober <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> and so the fact that the fact that um, these the fact that a, 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 a workshop about the Black Panther Party was scheduled at the same time as a work as a panel with three brilliant people like this is, first of all, a travesty in and of itself, regardless of whether Josh was supposed to be my co-facilitator or not. The fact that they scheduled Josh twice at the same time and then didn't inform any of us for a month and a half is actually just, like, right, anti-black misogyny, trans misogyny, and that's how it operates, right? It's not even, it's not even that these individual people were like, oh, I'm going to fuck this person over, or... It's actually even worse than that, right? It's actually that when folks make some decisions, they're not even considering the fact that we exist, even when even when they sign a check with our name on it every week, right? And so that's the that's the part that like really really gets real fucked up in this in this kind of situation, right? Also, the other the other fucked up thing is that those of us who come into those organizations and then try to redistribute some shit, some shit consistently have to fight for that, right? Like actually, like the experience, real talk, is that I had to sneak in. 20 fucking registrations of young, queer and trans, radical people of color who were doing this fucking work, right? Yeah. Sneak it in. Yes, yes. <laughs> right? Sneak it in. So, like, none of that shit makes any sense. None of it makes any sense. It's disgusting, right? Folks are, folks are getting asked to keynote year after year, week after week, after week, after week, and are never sent any job descriptions, are never sent any sort of stable employment, are never sent shit, except for can you come represent us at this single event so that we can pay you some money and feel good about the fact that we're literally contributing to your murders every other fucking day of the week. So that's the realness of it. So anyway, <laughs> thank you for letting me rant about that. Um, so I'm supposed to be talking about the Black Panther Party. <laughs> yeah, so, so the, the point really here is, is that, so all of these things, right, aside, if we can put those things aside, <coughs> that actually the work that we were doing with the Black Panther Party workshop and what we've been talking about here is the same shit, the right? Same shit. And what happens is we have all these weird dichotomies drawn out. We're like, okay, there's one workshop on racial justice and workshop one workshop on trans justice, as if we don't exist in those same bodies and space. Yes. Yes. And, as if, and, as if first, and as if also, like, within the history of the U.S. and the history of imperialism, mm-hmm. that the same <laughs> systems weren't that created race weren't also creating gender using the bodies of gender non-conforming and trans people of color, right? That like they only know they're white because they're not us. They only know they're they only know they're cis because they're not us, right? <laughs> right. And so like when we think about femininity that we're supposed to be that I'm supposed to be like aspiring to in order to be recognized as a legitimate femme, it's all, it's white femininity. And so that's the that's the other thing. And so that's. Yeah, and so fuck intersectionality because it doesn't mean anything because people literally think that there's this identity called black that's separate from gender and this, and this identity that, that is like woman that's separate from race and then when the two intersect then you somehow like pour two things into a chemistry set and you get a black woman. Like when does that happen? When did you get that? Like honestly, that's dumb as shit. Like, we, like if we don't talk about bodies and institutions then we're consistently going to fail every single community that we walk into. Um, and so I... So one of the things that I think is really important in talking about the Black Panther Party is talking about the ways in which um, they, they aspired to and also failed um, at thinking about bodies and institutions <coughs> in really specific ways, right? And so I think one of the things, one of the things that was really amazing about them is the, is the, um, 
survival programs that they consistently set up, right? The survival programs that they consistently set up starting in 1967. Um, starting with the Free Breakfast for Children program, starting with the Free Sickle Cell Anemia program, starting with the Bunchy Carter Free Medical Care program and People Center, right? Starting, starting with a lot of things, like we're in, actually in coalition with folks who are doing it for themselves elsewhere. You know, mm-hmm. so while the so the Black Panthers were going out and, and like stealing and selling that shit so that they yeah. can make money, at the same time, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries is also like doing sex work in order to raise money to house yeah. people, right? Yeah. That is that is in the leg- in the in the legacy of the Black Liberation Movement, right? That is in the le- that is in the Black Radical Tradition. Yeah. Um, Sylvia Rivera and Marsha Payette No Mind Johnson are in the Black Radical Tradition in okay. the same ways yeah. that Huey P. Newton and Bobby yeah. Seale and yeah. Angela Davis are. Yeah. And so we're got and so in, until racial justice movements admit that they're going to continue <coughs> to fail everybody who's not a cis, black, heterosexual man. Because at the end of the day, black cis men, for some reason, think that they're gender conforming in this racial system. And I can cons- consistently gag and giggle at that. <laughs> because it doesn't, because it never has made any sense. Um, and so um, when it comes to, as well, I think the thinking about the, um, the legacy of fundraising, the legacy of caring for our people, and what it really means to show up for those folks and include them in those dynamics, I think also about like, the movement for black lives convening, you know, oh. that was in Cleveland this summer, right? And so like, <laughs> yeah. so that was, its, that was its own experience where a lot of folks were like, Actually, just being fucked over and disrespected consistently yes. because the because the because the legacy of like black politics and the legacy of black radical politics continues to not account for gender, mm-hmm. continues to not account for sizeism, continues to not account for class, disability, even obviously or disability or fat justice. Or because anything. obviously, all of those things are always going to be included, right? Our par- our parents, our families, our ancestors, right? We're just as marginalized for being gender non-conforming, for being fat, for being ugly, for being like undesirable in the same ways that we're fighting today. And so the Black Panther Party was showing up for those people in ways that were consistently not enough, but were also consistently more visionary than the rest of the society around them. The Black Panther Party was consistently showing up for, tra- for, for communities in ways that like were aspirational and which inspired other people to, um, to think abolition, to think mm-hmm. abolition. And so if the Black Panther Party is coming and saying, we want free housing for all people, then they mean, actually, we, in, we also want free housing for trans and gender nonconforming people. Right. We also want free housing for disabled people. We also want free housing for everyone, for sex workers, for everybody, right? For people who, who, who are in the sex trades. And so if, the, if that is the radical legacy of the Black Panther Party and the racial justice movement claims to operate out of that legacy, then I think we should actually just rescind their fucking cards until they actually account for our existence. And, <laughs> and so that's where I'll end. Thank you. <laughs> We have a couple of minutes left for Q&A, but before then, we wanted to pass around this folder. So, obviously, the task...